some books in the Bible that actually are not that exciting, like parts of Chronicles, when you're going over um, genealogies, or when you're in Numbers, or when you're in Leviticus, and you got just the law uh, one right after another. Those are not particularly palpitating. There's not action. There's not a uh, pace, you see. However, there are enormous and beautiful nuggets of gold in there, but the thing is you have to dig for them. Now, Judy actually taught me to dig for these uh, nuggets when I'd, I'd get to uh, parts of Numbers or, or Chronicles or even Exodus, and it would be the, you know, the genealogical tables. I'd just skim over. She'd go, no, don't skim over. There's stuff that ties in and interweaves, and there are personalities that come back over and over again. And if you start tying the story together, it gets much more exciting. So uh, we're going to do Nehemiah chapter 9 tonight. Now, uh, we're going to start with John chapter 8. The chapter, the, the, the um, title of this is, You Shall Be Free Indeed. You see, one of the hardest things that we have to do in our lives is to define what slavery is. You guys can say, I'm not a slave. Well, okay, that depends on how you define slavery. Uh, if you don't get up off your duff and go do your job, you'll find out that the that the um, the punishment for not doing your job is going to be very quick and swift, and you're not going to have any food to eat. So you can say you're not a slave all you want, but all of us are slaves to a degree, in my opinion. Okay, we're slaves to something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, so uh, let's go to John chapter eight, verses thirty-one to thirty-three. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you will be my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Okay, uh, interestingly enough, when, when you, whenever you see the word if, Keep in mind that that means that something is conditional. That means that, that something is required of you. It's not just to where... Now, first of all, Jesus is the ultimate giver. He is the giver. We are the receiver. But as you all know, when you receive something, you do something with what you receive. I always say it this way, that you manage the blessing. Now, I'll give you an example of how that works in real time. God blessed me with a wife with the lovely lady that, that has been my companion and my friend for 37 years now. But I had the job of taking care of that blessing. I had to nurture it like she nurtures her relationship with me. God could bless me with this wonderful woman as he has blessed many people. But then if I go beating her up and speaking horribly to her and doing all kinds of things, she's going to leave and that blessing is not going to not going to stay with me. So managing the blessing. Other places where you manage the blessing would be in your finances with the, the money that God gives you or with your children if you have children, okay? Um, so, uh, or, or with the work that he has you do, it is a responsibility. It's a blessing. It makes your life worthwhile, but it also requires responsibility for the blessing, okay? So now he says, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples. So, it's not just enough that you just said, well, I'll do this one now, but, you know, maybe next week I'm kind of, you know, go off the ball for a while. Then I'll come back. Okay, that, 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 that doesn't work, as we know. That, that won't work, okay? Uh, then you are truly the disciples if you continue in my work. Notice that that has a kind of habit idea to it, a sequence, something that you default position to. Kind of like whenever you have a trouble in your life, the first thing you do, pray quickly, immediately. Before you do anything you else, see, pray. That's what you see Nehemiah doing. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. his default position. Now, this is, where, this is where the Word of God comes in as well, is that our default position gets food and starts changing as the eternal Word gets into us, you see. That's why we do this. That's why I, I'm not comfortable uh, having too many sessions without enough Word. Because it's the Word of God oh. that changes us. Okay? Now... Notice he says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And what was there? Now, keep in mind, it don't, don't let it go unnoticed that Jesus was saying these things to those who believed in him. Ah, mm. these weren't hostile people. 
Now then they try to justify themselves. Oh, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never yet been enslaved. What? Have you forgotten 430 years in the land of Egypt? What was that? Was that a penny whistle playing on the Trafalgar Square or something? Uh, what was that? And also at various times when you read in Judges, when they went into apostasy, okay, which means falling away from God, you had periods where the Philistines enslaved them. By the time we got to Saul and, and Samuel, the, the problem with the Israelites is they were not allowed to have any weapons of war. So their weapons of war, they took their farm implements and tools and sharpened them and tried to use them as weapons of war because the Philistines did not permit them to arm themselves. Have you noticed, though, that um, when Jesus tells us a truth like this, if you obey what I say, then you're really my, my um, disciples. disciples yeah that if they are not truly his disciples they argue and if if somebody tells me something or complains about some some aspect of their life and blah de blah de blah if i was to turn around and try to propose a solution if they just want to mouth off because they want somebody to feel sorry for them they'll do a yes bite now these people, <clears throat> I'm looking at this and saying that here is a yes but. They just simply want to be heard yeah, for their words. It's a yes but. Good. And it's they, they, there's a certain amount of guilt because they know that Jesus can actually see through the ones who are false. Would that be true to say? Yeah, absolutely. So so um, it is conditional. Now the reason why I said this is because when we're talking about rebuilding the wall, now the wall's been rebuilt, okay? They're out of slavery, but now what do they do with the blessing? Do you see? They can ruin the blessing quick, fast, and in a hurry by not doing certain things. And this is why I think it's such a great thing for us to go over Nehemiah, because from the very inception of the idea of rebuilding Jerusalem and the <laughs> deportees going back to Jerusalem, you see a process of success. This is what works, and this is why it works. So the most important part of what we've seen in chapters 1 to 8 has been the default position that Nehemiah had as a prayer warrior with Ezra, with the other Levites, quickly to pray immediately. They didn't go, oh no, what are they going to do to me? I don't. No, quickly. Lord, you see this. Lord, we put it to you. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to fix it yourself. Go straight to God. Now, God may have you do something in order to sort it out, but that would be an anointed, an, an anointed direction from the Holy Spirit. But if you don't put it to, to, to prayer first, you have not come under the covering of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you are praying, you are making contact with the Holy Spirit of God, and that is empowering you with Him. That brings Him into it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. so, so Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, keep in mind, last week we had the walls built and they had a praise party, right? And remember that they said uh, they, they wanted to weep and they wanted to fast. And, 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 and Nehemiah and Ezra and all the scribes and, 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 um, and uh, Levites said, no, this is a joyful occasion. Why? Because there was a recognition and a revelation of the sin that made it happen in the first place. Why were they crying? Because they realized in, in what uh, depths of despair they had fallen into. But now there is a place for repentance, there, as we'll see. Let's uh, read Nehemiah 9, verses 1 to 5. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Those then those of Israelite, Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day, and for, for the other fourth, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Then Jeshua, Bani, Kadamel, Shebaniah, Bani. 
Shariba, Bunny, ba- Barney and Chena- Ch- Chenani stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadimel, Barney, Hash- Hashabani, Sherebai, Hadija, <laughs> Shebaniah, <laughs> I'm getting tired, and uh, <laughs> Hathaniah said, <laughs> Stand up and bless the Lord God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all. Blessings and praise. You are alone. That's good. That's good. Up to there. Now, the thing that we need to understand in verse 2, it says that they did they, they forsake uh, the, the foreigners. There's something that we need to cross-reference there. I won't do it for you, but when you go to the book of Ezra, which is the scribe during exactly the same time period, uh, there were many of the Israelites that married foreign women who worshipped foreign gods. So what they did is they put away all non-believers. Okay? When they say foreigners, they mean non-believers. So this was an amazing is thing because... non-believers or non-Hebrews? It, 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 both. Okay. It's both. But it, this has always challenged me because you have many men who, who married uh, these wives, and I, I have every reason to believe that some of them loved them, but they put them aside because the Lord God commanded it of them. Okay? And the whole context here has to be connected with faith. It's not necessarily connected with nationality because God, if you see from right from the beginning, he is inclusive. He chooses Israel and the Jews as the chosen people, but he always leaves the door open for the foreigner. If you if you read Leviticus, if you read other parts of the scriptures, parts of Isaiah, um, it's all over the Bible where God is not is not excluding people. Okay, now the next thing that we that we can see is here we we have fasting and sackcloth and ashes. We have the repentance where the previous chapter they were specifically told not to. Now they're told to. Okay, now is the time for repentance because keep in mind repentance is only valid if it is precluded by knowledge. You have to know what you've done wrong. There's otherwise. Uh, repentance has no no meaning. Now, when they had a recognition of it, there was rejoicing because on the basis of that, they could do something about it. Whereas prior to that, if you, if you don't have any revelation of what the wrong is, there's nothing you can do, is there? Yeah. Repentance has to involve knowledge. It has to. Otherwise, it's not, it's not true. It's not real. Now, uh, the next thing we have to see is this is where I want to show you how you dig. Okay, now we have eight names in verse 4, and we have eight names in verse 5. Now, you'll notice that we have added Hodiah and Pethahiah, and we have excluded Bunny and Chinani. So now, I looked this up because I thought that's curious that we have two new names, and we have two names that have been excluded. So I looked them up. Now, Hodiah, the meaning is, Praise the Lord. That's the meaning of his name. Now, when you look up his scripture references, he helped Ezra explain the meaning of the word of God in the previous chapter. He also had a leading part in the praise, as we just read. Also, later on, spoiler alert, he was a signer of a covenant document, which we'll go into next week, okay? So that is a Hodiah. Now, Pethahiah, uh, is it means open the gates of the Lord. He was one of the Levites who'd married a foreign wife and he put her away. Okay, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. Now then he was an advisor from King Artaxerxes, the, 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 the Persian king, okay, who actually was the emperor over the entire known uh, uh, kingdom of he that was time. was married to Queen Esther. To Queen Esther. So we... We had a kingdom going all the way to what's present-day Morocco, down to the south of Basra, um, in Q- what's now Kuwait and, and Saudi Arabia in that area there, right to the very frontiers of India, up to the Black Sea, enormous, all of what's now I- I- Iran, 
of Iraq, Syria, <laughs> uh, Saudi Arabia, an enormous uh, uh, place. Now, let's take Bunni and Chinani. Now, I looked up the names, but it doesn't appear to be significant that these two Levite priests were omitted from the list established in the, in the prior case, in, in, in verse 4. Now, but sometimes when you investigate these things, you will find really fascinating stuff. So in this case, my research did not bear fruit. I did not make a connection between why these two names were added and two names were omitted. But I want to just encourage you in other places in scripture, it is really worth it. You'll dig stuff out and you go, oh, wow, that is really, really profound. So don't be afraid to dig for gold when you're going in your scriptures. In this case, it wasn't it, it wasn't fruitful. But no, but that doesn't mean to say it's not there. It means you just couldn't find it. Okay, that, mean, that's a good point. Yeah, you you've got to realize that in the, in the book of Chronicles, for example, there are hundreds of names, and it's very easy to actually sort of glaze over and not actually see them all. But occasionally, suddenly you'll see something and say, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, this morning I was looking through and I suddenly realized the lineage of, uh, do you remember um, when David ah, he went to the land of Nob, was it Nob? Not Nob, yes. And he took Goliath's sword and, and um, what's his face? The king, um, Saul, yeah. killed Ahitub. And I saw the lineage and I, and I thought, oh, do you know what you did? And I was horrified at what Saul had done because, I, because that was a holy line. Yeah, it was a very holy and, line, straight from Aaron. But I had never actually twigged the yeah. connection until this time of reading it through. So it may be that you pick up on the name, for example, Buni, which is a fairly unusual name. And then at some stage, you'll read through Chronicles and you'll see how it fits into the line. Yeah. And who his father was, who his grandfather was, who his son might have been. So, so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because your lineages, your genealogies, and some of the drier parts of the Bible, um, they're really relevant. But don't, don't be shy in asking questions when you see, when you see things like this. Like, I just noticed that two of the names were different. I went, okay, I wonder why. I wonder why. There's the question. I wonder why. And before I met this uh, wonderful young lady here, I would have just skimmed over numbers and chronicles. Okay, so, so let's go now from uh, verses, five, verses uh, 5b to 15. Now, the, uh, 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 I say 5b because you'll notice that the following 10 verses and the rest of the chapter are all written in prose because it is a poem, okay, in Hebrew. It doesn't come off as such in English because we don't have the same rules of um, poetic uh, structure and rhymes and things like that. But it's all written in a poem form and evidently it's because it was sung, Okay, so if we could read 5b to 15. Blessed your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are, are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their star, starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is, that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Ab Abram and brought him out of uh, of the oh, Chaldees. Uh, Chaldees. Chaldees, yeah, and named named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites. That's right. Hittites, yeah, <laughs> Amorites. Go, go! Oh, yeah. You're doing fine, darling. <laughs> Perizzites, Jebusites, and Gergashites. Okay. You have kept your promise because you are high. You you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry 
at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land. For you knew how, how arrogantly and how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided this sea before them so that they passed through through it on the on dry ground. But you held their you held their pursuers into the depth, like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the way they were they were to take. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right, and dec decrees and commands that are that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. Is that it? Oh, one more. One more, please. Oh. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hands, with uplifted hands to give them. Okay, that's good. Now, here's another idea of how to pick apart scripture. Okay, now. Whenever you have praise and worship, it should be directed to the Lord. Not like how I feel or whatever. I mean, this is my personal opinion. If I'm talking about how I feel and how it makes me feel all fluttery inside, okay, that's all nice and sweet and everything, but that's not praising Him. That's praising me. Yeah. I want to praise Him. Now, in this particular text that you just read, we have the word you or its derivatives, your, your, um, 25 times in 10 verses. 25 times you have you or the derivatives of the word you signifying God, modifying God. So you can see that the praise is directed to God. You, you don't see me in there. You don't see us. You don't see we. You don't see I, me. You see you. So whenever I... Uh, choose praise and worship, okay? Now, I was a, a praise and worship leader for probably about 20 years uh, in churches, and one of the uh, types of ideas that I would always go through when I would be choosing songs is I want to avoid personal pronouns that, that point to me. If I see too many me, I, mine, ours, us, then I'm I'm suspicious because I'm 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 thinking maybe I'm not praising God maybe I'm just uh, maybe I'm worshiping worship you see mm. so I want to worship my God and if I'm going to worship God it has to point to Him not to me that's what's happening in what you just read the verses five to fifteen okay now let's go verses um, sixteen to twenty five. But they, our ancestors, were arrogant, bullheaded. They wouldn't obey your commands. They turned a deaf ear. They refused to remember the miracles you had done for them. They turned stubborn, got it into their heads to return to their Egyptian sla uh, slavery. And you, a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, incredibly patient, with tons of love. You didn't dump them. Yes, even when they cast a sculpted calf and said, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt and continued from bad to worse. You and your amazing compassion didn't walk off and leave them in the desert. The pillar of cloud didn't leave them. Daily it continued to show them their route. The pillar of fire did the same at night. Showed them the right way to go. Where do you want me to go? Uh, up, to, uh, up to 25, please. You gave them your good spirit to teach them to live wisely. You were never miserly with your manner. Gave them plenty of water to drink. You supported them 40 years in the desert. 
They had everything they needed. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet never blistered. You gave them kingdoms and peoples, establishing generous boundaries. They took over the country of Sion, king of Heshbon, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied children for them, <coughs> rivaling the stars in the night skies, and you <coughs> brought them into the land that you promised them, promised their ancestors that you would uh, get for their own. <coughs> well, th they entered all right. They took it and settled in. The Canaanites who lived there, you brought to their knees before them. You turned over their lands and kings and peoples to do with as they pleased. They took strong cities and fertile fields. They took over well-furnished houses, cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, and lush, extensive orchards. They ate and grew fat on the fat of the land. Okay, now, interestingly enough, I've taken the pronoun uh, they, meaning us, you know, the, the people. sinful people, uh, no less than 32 times. They and their derivatives... And here we're only talking about nine verses, and we have 32 times they. Now, every time you have that association with they, you can see that it's a negative. They did this, they did that, oh my word. Uh, but um, in the previous one, when it's you, every time you pertinent to God was brought forward, it was glorious, wonderful, superb. And now we have they, oh dear, we're, we, we, we just blow it time and time again. Okay, now let's go verses 26 to 31. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself and worked great provocation. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard them from heaven and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did all before you. Therefore, you left them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard them from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies and testified against them that you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks and would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit in your prophets, yet they would not listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for you are God, gracious and merciful. Okay, now here is just a snapshot of the book of Judges and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, that time and time and time again, and of Chronicles, uh, you have... Uh, they they cry out for a deliverer because they've they've judges. fallen into and judge did I not say judges, uh, the book of judges where where they fall into sin they they forsake God, they, and they are taken over by their enemies they cry out to God God delivers them and that cycle repeats itself over and over again in the Old Testament okay so that's what's happening in verses twenty six to thirty one God's corrective hand. Uh, because of the beha the outrageous behavior by the Israelites, they rebelled, threw away the law. Even after the correction, they recidivated and turned back to their evil, unbelieving ways. Now, note uh, verse 31, how the door remains wide open all the time. Nevertheless, that beautiful word in verse uh, uh, 31, nevertheless, or paraphrased, even so, okay, in your great compassion, you didn't make an end of them. And re remind yourself that way back in the time of Moses, he said to Moses, why don't I just wipe these guys out and I'll, I'll establish a lineage from your family. And Moses interceded and said, no, 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 Lord, because 
and I think God was testing him there. I don't think God was going to do that, but he wanted to, you know, he wanted to sound out uh, uh, Moses' resolve, okay? So uh, here we have that snapshot, always falling into sin, calling out for deliverance, being delivered. What happens? They go straight back into it. Now let's go uh, 26, no, 32 to the end of the chapter. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and on all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. However, you are just in all that has befallen us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and testimonies, which you testified against them. For they have not served you in their kingdom, or in the many good things that you gave them, or in the large and rich land which you set before them, nor did they turn from their wicked works. Here we are, servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers, to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it, and it yields much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of this, we make sure a covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. Okay, now, the thing is, is Nehemiah acknowledges God's attributes, and he requests... And, and requests that he, he, he look upon their new life with favor. Now, this whole uh, section, if I were to sum it up, I would say that he's asking for good leadership. He's asking that God would intervene uh, for all of the people that now have responsibility in this new restored kingdom of Israel. The walls have been rebuilt. The doors have been rehung. The guards at the gates. There is order that has been restored. Now, he, he, the prior chapter, he was talking about um, uh, praise and, and recognition, the reading of the Word of God. Here we have repentance, and, and we have um, a prayer for the leaders. Now, one of the things that we need to do as believers, we need to pray for our leaders. Now, this is going to be difficult sometimes, because I'll tell you what, we've got some real jokers in places of power right now. We really do have some very bad leaders all over the world. It's, 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 there is a, a, a terrible, terrible penury of good leadership. But keep in mind that we will kind of get the leaders we pray for. How much yeah. prayer has gone into the prime minister? How much prayer has gone into the king, gone into uh, the House of Commons or the House of Lords? How much prayer has gone into our police, into the NHS? into the school system. So it's not surprising that they are not supported by prayer that all kinds of devilish things are going to come out of them because they will operate on how much prayer we put into them. That's why God says to pray for your leaders. Very, very important. And this whole, the, the, these last six verses of Nehemiah chapter 9 are, Lord, lift up the leaders. Um... Our kings, our leaders, our priests have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments. In other words, what he's saying, Nehemiah is saying, can you please give us leaders who will pay attention to your laws, who will pay attention to your commandments and your statutes. So will you please give us leaders that will accept your admonitions, that will walk in your ways?